How's everybody doing? Yeah, have a handout. You got your handout. Good, good, good. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. I'm looking at Allie, and and I had it all in my head, and then I got caught up in the hymn, and I forgot. I was gonna tell people to sign the book. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Your coffee today is from Bolivia, a country in South America. A fine place. It's fair trade organic, too. I don't know. Whatever. I'm not, I don't care about fair trade or organic, for that matter, when it comes to coffee. Because none, none, none of these farmers can afford pesticides. Oh, you're buying it from I'm buying it from small farms, yes. They can't afford to do that. But if you want certified organic, then fine. Then they have, they have to pay the USDA to fly down to Bolivia and monitor their farm all the time. It's like, nothing like the US government getting involved in Bolivian coffee farming. I mean, if that's your market. Okay, you've got a handout, good. All right, so let's begin, if you would. Uh, let's start with prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good job, Dorothy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. Anybody else need it? Down. Anybody else? This one the problem? That one I can't do anything about. I'm sorry. Hopefully, that's just my, that's just in my eyes. This is why I go in to talk to Allie in her office. She doesn't have blinds. And I get the reflection off of the church. And I'm like, oh, I can't see. I'm seeing spots. All right. Uh, last week, we talked about chapter 36, how it, the beginning of 36 is the continuation of the end of 35. So we went through the first part because it's and you. You can catch the conjunction there. It's connected to what came before. We went all the way through um, verse... Uh, we kept going. The mountains of Israel. So we had Mount Seir, remember, which was the mount of, that represented which people? The red people. Remember the red? Yeah, the Edomites. That's right, the Edomites. All right, and then that was set in contrast to the mountain of Israel. And one of the points that we made, probably two weeks ago, maybe last week too, is that, um, and this is going to be true as well for today, is that God's name, God's people, God's land, God's temple, or his dwelling place, um, they're all intimately connected in a way that if you profane God's name, then you profane his people and his land and his dwelling place. Or you profane his dwelling place, you're profaning his name, his people, and the land that he dwells in, right? Um, and so this was in specific the land, the pro profanity of God's land. We, we have a problem with profanity. <laughs> Sorry, that's pastor. It's a funny joke. Not really funny. Profane speech, right? right? But we miss that in the Bible, pr to profane is to... Um, it has a sense of uncleanness. So I think... How does Paul say it? No crude joking in church. No crude joke. Filthy talk and crude joking. I don't remember which epistle that's in. It's one of our epistle readings in the year. Right? So you don't hear pastors telling dirty jokes, hopefully. It's just not appropriate, right? But, especially because you're in the context of hearing and receiving God's word, it should never be on your lips, probably. Yeah, I don't know. I guess if you're a comedian, then you're licensed. I'd... Right, it belongs all to the, uh, to the second commandment, right? Not misusing God's name. So cursing, swearing, use satanic arts, lying or deceiving, all that kind of filthy talk belongs there. All right. So here, they're going to profane, but they're, not, they're going to profane the land by doing things on the land that's inappropriate, right? That, that is contrary to God's word. So we are going to jump in at verse 16, and we're not going to get very far today, I think, because we have a few things to talk about. But maybe we can, uh, if we finish it, then we just keep moving. But I don't know that we will. So let's read uh, 16 through 21. What's on the screen there? The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the 
house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that people said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. All right. So if you've been with us uh, for any length of time, you probably recognize the formulas here. Right. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Right. That's the title for Ezekiel here to prophesy. And then you'll see the formula continue here. Therefore, say to the house of, the, of Israel, thus says the Lord God. And then you know how the formula ends. And they will know that I am the Lord. <laughs> right. So that's kind of been the, the prophetic pattern. I mean, it is helpful for preaching if the preacher is somewhat predictable. Because <laughs> then if there is a, a called for like liturgical kind of response, you're like, oh, yeah, when he says that, I'm supposed to say this, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so when these prophecies happen, you'll find that formula. And that's why I suggested to you, this should be the beginning of chapter 36. And the previous 15 verses belong with the end of 35, which was the shortest chapter in Ezekiel. So it, it doesn't even make sense. Anybody want to figure out how to convince people to change the chapter number um, in all of our Bibles? In all time? Uh, We'll do it by the holy decree of the Bishop of Random Lake. <laughs> what? First thing, alert the media. Alert the media, that's right. <laughs> Let's have a press conference. The Bible's numbering is wrong. Pastor corrects. All right, anyway, it doesn't matter. But you can tell by the formula, right? Because this is how the chapters have been beginning. The word of the Lord came to me. It's a good break there. All right, so now again, like we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the land and profaning their own land. And how did they defile it or profane it, make it dirty or unclean by their ways and their deeds? All right. And we've heard a lot of these sorts of things throughout the chapter. But I gave you some of the examples here. Um, some examples would be what? Uh, such abominations that require expulsion include homosexuality, incest, bestiality, child sacrifice, and occult practices. Who says the Bible's not interesting? Right, you can read about those in Leviticus 18 and 20. Or you could say, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, Leviticus, 4,300, 4,500 years ago, writing the same thing. Maybe the human heart hasn't changed all that much, except by God's giving forgiveness. Yeah. Um, other sorts of defilement would be sexual unchastity. So we'll talk about that this week with the sixth commandment, right? <coughs> Unexpiated bloodshed. So that's the fifth commandment. You shall not murder. Is that right? You shall not murder. I'm looking at the children. They're not responding. Okay. Don't worry. They'll say it in chapel. Um, by the <laughs> overnight exposure, an executed cr criminal would make the land defiled. So what did they have to do with Jesus before sunset? Take him down from the cross, lest the land be defiled. Yeah. Yep. Uh, touching a carcass. Don't do that. Experiencing a bodily discharge. That's fun. And then, I'll, of course, just idolatry. They pollute the land and require, and it depends on the severity of it, separation or segregation for a time, and then ritual cleansing as well. So all that belongs to the land. Um, Ezekiel has been talking about defilement of the land before, though. He talked about it... Uh, we talked about all sorts of defilement. We talked about, where is this? The second sentence, I think, or third. While Ezekiel has frequently spoken of the people defiling themselves, I gave you a few examples there, the temple being defiled, Yahweh's holy name, and a neighbor's wife. He seems to be caught up on that, too. This is the only place that he speaks of a land itself as defiled. All right? So this is a unique thing, so it's worthy of our consideration uh, and some, with some length. A land could be defiled uh, if the pagans come to live on it, right? And why would that be? Because what do the pagans bring with them? 
their pagan gods, correct? And with their pagan gods? Pagan worship. Yeah, the stuff the pagan gods require, which a lot of them are already listed. Sexual in, unchastity, like temple prostitution, child sacrifice, the stuff with homosexual practice, all this. Their gods would demand that. So then they would defile the land, you see? So pagans can, pagan living in the land could do that, or just the misbehavior of the occupants. All right. So that's pretty important. Um, you can read about this. Maybe this is worth looking at. So let's just jump there. Leviticus 18. Sometimes people get hung up on this. God commanded them to go and destroy all the Canaanites because he's such an evil God, right? That's why he did that. He hated the Canaanites, so he just wanted them to all die. Uh, he actually tells you why. The land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. What a beautiful picture. The land vomiting. It's kind of like a, like a volcano, right? Is that what you're thinking? By the way, it's the same language used for, for Jonah when he's in the belly of the fish. And the fish vomits him out on the land. Yeah. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations. That is, the abominations of the Canaanites. Either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. So even the guest cannot do things that defile the land either. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. And then here's the threat. Lest the land vomit you out when you make, your, make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you. This is, children, if you like to illustrate things, this would be a good story to illustrate. The land vomiting people. You know the story. I've told you the story. My, my grade school art teacher she was like, illustrate a Bible verse. She thought it would be a great project for us. She asked the wrong person. <laughs> Apparently, I was a little theologically adept at using a, found a Bible with a concordance in the back and found all the fun words, like vomit. The first one I did, yeah, no, that's what I ended up illustrating. And then I got in trouble for it. It was with the priests all get drunk and they're vomiting on the altar. I wish that she got, she destroyed the art. I mean, come on. I can't tell the story now. You just have to imagine it, right? Yeah. It's been a great thing. I'll show you. Just like I did when I was a... What's that? I should draw another one. Yeah. All right. I, I think, you know, my artistic skills of, of youth, um, I, since I haven't maintained them, I don't know that they're quite what they were then. All right. Anyway. Uh, for everyone who does any of these abominations, that the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So there's the separation, right? So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never to make yourselves unclean by them. So there, you are unclean. You make it, the land unclean. I am the Lord your God. So the reason why the Canaanites are cut off, absolutely, as in they were judged ahead of time with death, was because of their idolatry. Their idolatry, right? And the land, which was the Lord's land, the land was setting, being set apart by God, couldn't even hold them. In the same way that death could not hold Christ because he died the death of death. He died for sins. So death couldn't hold him in the grave and it had to vomit him out of the grave. You hear that language in not so much our hymns, but in some of the, uh, the older hymns about the resurrection. It's like with, the, yeah, with the, the grave vomiting him out. Because he is, in a sense, he's an abominable. Jesus is abominable to death. Ooh, that's kind of fun, right? All right. So that's Leviticus 18, that's the basis. And again here, the basis of the threat that if they do the things that the Canaanites do, what's gonna to happen to them? They're gonna get vomited out just as the Canaanites did. And guess what happened? The people are in Babylon because the land vomited them, vomited, this is a fun word to say over and over, vomited them out. All right, um, and notice, Right, I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land. So that's that unrequited blood or that un, what did I call it? Un something blood, unexpiated. So remember, if, if somebody commits murder, guess what's required of them? That they die. But if you fail to do that, that's under the Lord's command. So if you fail to execute the death sentence, the death penalty upon those who take a life, then um, now you're unclean because you've forsaken God's word. That was also true uh, for abortion, by the way. If you take a child that had not yet been born, then your life was forfeit. Hmm. 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 Eh, some things to think about there. 
Uh, I scattered them among the nations. They were dispersed through their countries, right? Just as he said he would do, he did. God is faithful to his word, even to his harsh words of judgment, right? Um, but not forever, thank God. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judge them. So is God just in his, in his actions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they came to the nations, here's what's interesting. Wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that the people said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they had to go out of his land. All right, so then there's this profanity of his name, so that it, but it's the foreigners who recognize that the land vomited them out, so clearly they had forsaken the Lord, and then by forsaking the Lord, they have forsaken his holy name as well. Remember, the name and the land and the people and the worship all go together. Right, so think of the second commandment, which we did two weeks ago, not this last week, the week before, right? You should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. All right. Satanic arts, you could just say, we used to say witchcraft, um, but I think you could just say pagan idolatry. I mean, it's included. Any, I've been watching a show. It's actually surprisingly good. I was, I don't know. It's called Dark Winds. It's about... Like a, it's set in the 70s and it's on the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. Um, and it's cops, but there's also this, there's this intersection with the, with the, I don't want to call it voodoo because that's Haiti, but whatever the Navajo equivalent, what well, they call it, they call it black magic. So there's a witch and, and she's affecting the, the criminal case. And we say, oh, that can't be real. Um, yeah, it can be actually, <laughs> right? Yeah, satanic arts. So if you talk to a, a Navajo turned Christian, they'll say that, you know, they'll talk about the satanic attacks. Um, that's, they recognize who it actually was working that whole time, putting their fear, love, and trust in like the earth or the wind or the, or the corn pollen or whatever. Yeah. All right. Um, so the P, this is just like what we heard with Moses. When he makes intercession, we heard this on, what day did Moses, yeah, Moses, what day did Moses, did we hear about Moses going up on the mountain to make intercession for the people after the golden calf? I don't know which day it was, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe Wednesday. So you remember when Moses went up on the mountain, he said, God, you are gracious and merciful. Actually, God said he was gracious and merciful and long suffering. So on the basis of that, I'm not going to destroy this people. But before that, Moses had, one of the intercessions he made was, what are the Egyptians going to say if you just destroy these people? Right. Now we see the same idea here. The people in the four nations, in the, amongst the Gentiles, are saying, these are the people of the Lord, yet they had to go out of this land and they profaned my holy name. So look at what he says. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. All right. So Moses' intercession is, is another way of commend, or actually commending God to, to do what he says he was do. Is that, what's the second commandment? Hallowed, no, that's the first petition. Hallowed be your name. We pray for that. And the second commandment we say, shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Right? Now, shall not, English is really, we don't want to change the catechism too much too often because then people get confused. You know, which will happen next week when we get to bear false witness or give false testimony. Who learned it which way? I don't remember which way is which. I always just say it both ways now because I can't remember which one's the right one, <laughs> the current one. <laughs> bear false witness is the old one, I think. Yeah, give false testimony is today. It is harder to say. I agree. Yeah, they changed the explanation too. Say everything in the kindest way is the explanation now. It used to be put the best construction on everything. Yeah, so, uh, but in any case, why are we saying translate? Oh, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now, shall not um, is kind of difficult in English because we don't use shall any other time pretty much. You will not. Right, and so you heard in the sermon, and I got this out of this large catechism from Luther, is that, I think it was, oh no, it's from somebody else. But you shall not means you, you, you shouldn't, but you also won't. <laughs> so God is not going to allow his name to be profaned among his people. And that, that's why he takes action here against them. Right? Which is for their good, right? 
He wants them to keep the commandment, but they can't. And so he actually does it for them and to them, in a way. All right, good so far? All right, where were we? Oh, I have more notes about verse 18. All right, all moral and liturgical offenses are sins against the first commandment. All right, so we talk about this. With the, we'll get this when we get the conclusion of the commandments in a few weeks. To break one commandment is to break the first commandment. Always. All right. That's why every commandment's explanation starts. We should fear and love God. Right? So every commandment begins in its explanation with the first commandment again. Because God is your God and no other. We should. Yeah. All right. Um, idolatry includes unclean rites and liturgical abuses. All right. So we've talked about some of this. The outpouring of blood implies murder, a moral offense. Oh, we didn't talk about the simile. Oh, well, I don't want to miss that. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. And you say, that's not true. I don't know, women can probably talk to this. It's kind of, it's kind of gross. I'm sorry. I'm a man. I guess that's just me. Yeah, it is. Although on the, in the, on the show I was talking about, Dark Winds, it's AMC. Anyway, um, they have like the opposite. It's like, they have this big party for the, and the whole community knows that she started to menstruate and they have this big thing and there's the ceremonies and all sorts of stuff. It's kind of like, uh, what's the one that the Hispanic folks do? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's a I think it may be age-based though on that, isn't it? It's age. It's, it's age. It, it probably used to be menstruation and then they... Suffering. Yeah, yeah, because we don't want to talk about that. Right. And because there is this inherent sense that it's impure, and that goes all the way back to Leviticus. All right. Uh, and of course, there's the sloughing off of, of cells and with the blood and everything. So there is a sense of clean. There's a clean. There's a cleaning that's happening as well as it's an impurity that's coming out. Uh, so for that, you look to where is the bit about menstrual uncleanness in Leviticus? Oh, did I not give you a citation? Oh, I did. Leviticus 15. So when you're when you're want to gross out your kids. This is where you want to go and talk about this section here. Oh, it even talks about semen. Let's not do that. Oops. It, yeah, that, I told you about discharges. Yeah, there it is. The woman who has a discharge. Menstrual impurity discharge. Uh, she is set apart for seven days. Um, and then anybody who touches her during those seven days is also unclean until the evening. Sorry, men. Um, and then everything she, uh, she lies on is also unclean. It has to be purified. This is, this is really quite something, isn't it? Even the things she sits on shall be unclean. There's an interesting story about this with Jacob. And is it Rachel that sits on the household gods during that time of month? Yeah, she steals her father's household gods. And you're like, oh, she just wants to worship them. Except she sits on them during her time of impurity. So what's she doing to the household gods? She's defiling them. Yeah, she's defiling them which is a bold confession of faith, right? All right. Uh, and whoever touches her bed, da, 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 you get the idea. It's like, there's all sorts of things. Oh, but we want to talk about it. She's bleeding, but she's to bathe herself in water to, to be cleansed. And this is going to come back in our chapter, water and blood together. And you can probably, probably have some questions about water and blood and why are they always together? Here's part of the reason. Uh, and of course, her husband has to stay away from her. That's probably wise anyway. That was a joke. You don't have to laugh. It's funny. Um, oh, yes. Oh, we already talked about this. And then it, it, it repeats. It's always like, here's the instructions, and then they repeat the instructions again. Like, okay, we got the point the first time. Um, and by the way, at the end, the, priest, uh, the, the men have discharged too, and they're unclean as well. Okay. So you get the idea. So this is a simile here. Is there another time that you can remember menstrual impurity being a reference to um, just like spiritual impurity in the New Testament. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard this preached. What's that? Yeah, well, there is the woman with, who's been bleeding for 12 years. That's, or not, is it 12 years? Yeah, it is 12 years. Well, that's, that's actually, that wasn't the one I was thinking of, but that's a good one. All right. And Jesus cleanses her, right? She's been impure for 12 years, nonstop, right? Yeah, so that's extraordinary. That's a good, good that's not what I thought of, but that's good. 
No, it's, it's Paul's statement. All our works are, what does he say? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. That's, I don't know why we can say menstrual impurity here, but we can't say menstrual rags there. I don't know why that we don't translate it accurately. And we say filthy rags because we don't want to say that in church, say menstrual rags in church. But what do you do with menstrual rags when you're done with them? Unless you have the washable ones. Don't talk about them. We're weird. You throw them away. That's exactly right. So all our works are for the refuse pile and they're unclean. Apart from the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. So now you know how bold of a statement that was from Paul. Yeah. To call, to call our works the equivalent of the... Th- what defile these people and send them out of the land. All right. But of course, people, we tend to put trust in our works and set that opposed to faith in God. And that's when they become unclean. All right. So you've got that. Any, what else did I write? Yes. The woman would be unclean for seven days and not approach in the same way. So this is a simile. The land is going to be left fallow for a time, but it's more than seven days. It's 40 years. Remember, there is no sharp distinction. We talked about this. To profane one is to profane them all. So defiling the land by worshiping falsely and living unethically is to profane God's name. And they took that profanity of God's name with them into exile among the nations where they go, which we talked about. All right. So that's, this is the condition to which the prophet now is going to speak to. Um, by the way, do you think the people liked hearing what Ezekiel was saying? No. No. I was thinking this morning, um, and I'm, so I'm just going to say it out loud here, and just something I toyed with, is that um, the way that we were trained as pastors is that you, you never, you always let the gospel predominate. And we get that from the book of Acts. You read the preaching of, of Peter or Paul um, or the other apostles. Yes, they always, accuse, they always preach the law for the accusing role to show us our sin, but they never fail to preach Christ for forgiveness. That's not the case with the prophets. Like, what did we figure out? Ezekiel went for like 12 years preaching only law pretty much. <laughs> and the people are just, what, they're left to despair and hopeless? Yeah. So I thought maybe we'd start to do that. So come the end of, you know, the last few Sundays of the church here, I'm only going to preach law and you're going to have to wait till Christmas to hear the gospel. <laughs> and, the, and that's when the district office gets called. Pastor won't forgive our sins. <laughs> he keeps telling us we're sinners, but he won't forgive them. He says we have to wait till Christmas. No, oh, that's funny. There is a sense that that season does that. Same with Lent, right? You're kind of like, when are we going to get to Easter already? Even though the gospel is being preached throughout. Okay. I'm being funny. Half. Oh, dead. They learned from a very young age how, how to discern between the truth and fiction through sarcasm. It's, it's a very fine art that has to be honed. <laughs> Especially if, he doesn't, if you don't look for a smile or something. All right. Good so far? All right, the next part we're going to spend a lot of time on. So, or as much time as we need to anyway. We're going to read, just read 22 through 25. Well... Yeah, we better just do that. 22 through 25. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to ask, but for the sake of my own name, which you have profaned, profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the wickedness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before your eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Sorry. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean and from all your idols. All right. Yeah, and, and like I said, we, I really want to keep going, but we've got a lot to cover there. Um, but if you'll notice, I'm just going to scroll. We're not going to read it. Um, but like, as you keep going through here, what, what, what is the subject in almost all these sentences? I, 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 right? With the result of you, I, you, I, I, 
I, I, <laughs> then you, 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 I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. All right. So um, generally speaking, when we see this kind of construction where it's God is the subject, so he's the one doing the verbs, it's good news. Or at least can be received as good news. It can also be re- received as an accusation and, and terrifying too. All right. So I will act because God does what we cannot. That's the key there, right? If God's doing it, it's because we won't or we don't or we can't. All right. So let me scroll back up so you can see. All right. So remember, it's his name that Israel has profaned, right? Um, so it doesn't ever mention, and we didn't read all of it, but it never mentions. Well, actually, the basis for God's acting is not their love for him and their faithfulness or the good that they've done or the way that they've been, you know, good little boys and girls and Santa Claus is going to give them good gifts. Sorry. Oh, did I say Santa Claus? No. Why is the basis of him acting for their good and for the good of the world? Their sin and their rebellion and their hatred of him and the way they defiled the land and the way they took their idolatry even with them into Babylon. So that Babylon's saying, look at him defiling God's name. Even the Babylonians see them doing it. Don't do that, Esther. Yeah. Uh, So this is a profound example, and it's used in our Lutheran confessions in a couple places. Um, But in Augsburg, in the Augsburg Confession, which is the theological foundation, or theological constitution of our church, you want to know pretty much on any doctrine what we believe, go to the Augsburg Confession. It's in our official name as a congregation. And not the altered one, but the unaltered one. Let's be clear. There's an altered Augsburg Confession. We don't subscribe to that one. We want the real one. You know, it's like no light beer only. Anyway. No laughs, not even a chuckle. Uh, In the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, and then it's apology or defense, Article 4 as well. They match up. They're the same numbers. Uh, On on the article of justification by faith, through grace. You know, you've heard that formula. We hear it at Reformation time every year. We've been saved by grace through faith, and this is not our own doing. It's the gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should boast, right? To quote, quote the apostle. And so, yes, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of his uh, character. And in this case, he's going, to, he's going to make his name holy among them again, um, despite them. And he's going to do everything that's necessary for that to happen. So we would call this the sola gratia motif, or by grace alone, by God's giving alone. The people, this is then that third paragraph, the people have long forfeited any claims to Yahweh's compassion or obligation to help them. Since the fall, and this is to quote Augsburg 2 in Formula 1, mankind is non posse non peccare. Non posse non peccare. Who learned Latin in school? Anybody go to Catholic school, learn some Latin? It just means not able not to sin. It's a double negative. Which is beautiful in Latin, right? Non, non. Not able not to sin. That's man. Which, uh, we, what do we call that usually? We call that the doctrine of, which is Formula One. Not the race cars, but Formula of Concord, Article One. We call that original sin. So the distinction between sins that are committed, thought, word, and deed, and the sin of origin, which is our, we call that our sinful nature too. Right? Not able not to sin. All right, good. So if we're not able not to sin, then who alone can save us? The one who is sinless, right, Jesus. So I didn't give you, there, in that same article, they give you the same kind of formula, but for Jesus, and I just can't remember what it is, is that he's not able, what, no, how is it? He's, he's not able to sin or something like that. I don't remember how it goes. In contrast, you could look to Isaiah 43 to 44. Ezekiel stresses here God's name and his holiness. There's no action of man. There's, we don't contribute anything helpful here at all. Right? He does it all. Um, he wins triumph over the other gods and wins awe and dread of his name and reestablishes his great name among Israel. So again, we see, shh, don't. We see that he is the subject, and so he's the one doing the verbs which is, that means it's by grace. It's by his giving, all right? 
Um, then, what did I say? He uses, oh yes, in verse 24, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. That sounds familiar. That sounds like Exodus, right? Take them out of Egypt and into the promised land, into your own land. So that theme of Exodus is going to be through the rest of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to see it all over the place. And then in the New Testament, it's probably... I'm trying to think if the New Testament uses, talks more about Abraham or, or about the Exodus as a picture of God's grace. They're like, I think Exodus is number two. I think Abraham's mentioned more, but the Exodus is a real close second. And so then that's why we hear that language of Exodus all through Easter. Uh, and at baptism too, by the way, right? As that God delivers us from sin, death, and devil into promised land. But why is the key, why Exodus? What do you have to go through to get into the promised land? Water. Very, exactly right. Yeah, through water. Whether it be the Red Sea or then the Jordan, right? Yeah. And so from the apostles, they've seen that, that crossing of the Jordan on dry land or, or the Red Sea crossing as a picture of baptism. And even explicitly say so in the New Testament. All right, so that's not a new thing. Shh. It's too squeaky. We don't want squeaky. Squeaky is distracting. <laughs> she thinks she's so cute. All right. And then she knows it. Embrace it when you know. Yes, she is. I know. All right. By the way, Luke picks up on this in Luke chapter 9, verse 31. This is right after the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he sets his face towards Jerusalem. All right. But when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke, it says that he's conversing with Moses about his exodus. Not Moses's, but the Lord's exodus. And then he turns his face towards Jerusalem and he's, he's on his way to the cross from there on out. It's really beautiful in Luke. So Luke is really emphasizing the exodus as well. Um, the language of the exodus and baptism, water I should say. Oh, I got ahead of myself. You're thinking baptism. You can't help it, right? Look at this. 1 Corinthians 10, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. We heard about that this week, right? The cloud over the, yep, the tabernacle, good. And all passed through the sea, that's the Red Sea, and all were baptized, he even uses the word baptized, baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, think manna, good. And all drank the same spiritual drink. Hmm, which one is he talking about there? For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So when Moses strikes the rock, now comes water. Or when he makes the bitter water sweet. Yeah. Either way. But I, I, here's the rock being struck, and then out comes water. And St. Paul says that rock was Jesus. What? <laughs> yeah. Never the, it was more than once. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And they took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Don't be idolaters. And that keeps, Paul does not let you off the hook. All right, so, no, does anyone. Uh, let's see, where was I? Yep, so baptism, water, exodus, all tied together as well. All right, and so it seems like he's, he's got that going on here because they're going to be returned to their own land taking them from all the nations that they've been scattered because of their, because of their uncleanness, right? Um, and then, here's where we want to spend most of our time, because I think we talked about profanity before, is verse 25. I'll scroll up so you can read it from the back. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. That's a fun word. Uncleannesses is. is and from all your idols... I will cleanse you. All right. So sprinkling, clean water. When we hear sprinkle in the Bible. I gave you lots of on this. We hear this in this verse in church, so it's worth spending some time um, putting some uh, flesh onto it for you. The sprinkling usually is connected to the sprinkling of blood. So the blood of the covenant, um, the blood of the on the day of atonement when the the Passover lamb is sacrificed, and then the blood is sprinkled on the altar and on the people, right? So you have blood being sprinkled on the people. 
And then, of course, we can't help but hear Jesus saying this blood is, or this is the, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. There we go. Which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Right? The new covenant, not like the old covenant, not by the blood of bulls and goats, right? But by the blood of Jesus, right? That's the new covenant. You are being sprinkled. So this is going to be helpful for you if you're following along in the daily prayer, is that all the liturgical rites, so the tabernacle, including the cloud and the fire and smoke, and all the, all the tabernacle furnishings, all the prescriptive sacrifices, they all testify to Jesus. All right? And the reason why most people don't want to read Leviticus or about ritual uncleanness for women during that time of month is because they don't want to think about how does this confess Christ? But Jesus says to do that. All scriptures testify of me. And then the, the apostles take that language and bring it, like I said, all our works are menstrual rags. So we're talking, oh, that means he wants you to think of Leviticus 15 and think about ritual impurity. And we don't bring your works to the altar unless you're bringing them to confess them, <laughs> right? Because they're unclean. They need to be forgiven. All the works need to be forgiven. That's Paul's assertion, which is... Not everybody believes this. It's probably worth mentioning. As most of us think not, we don't think of ourselves as non posse, non picara, picari. We think of ourselves as kind of half and half, right? We're kind of sinners and we're kind of saints. Fitty, fitty, as they say at the, uh, uh, among certain people. All right, so <laughs> half and half. Part, partum, partum is actually how they say it in Latin in the Confessions. We're not partum partum. We're not part sinner and part saint. Right? As if you, how would I make the line of, how would I distinguish it? It's like the poor baby that Solomon proposes cutting in half, right? What's going to end up happening if you try to split the two? <laughs> ah, yes. Aren't we sinners, saints and sinners at the same time? All right? Yeah. And you'd say totem totem, not partum partum. If you want some Latin, you like Latin? You like Latin. Uh, I don't care if you like Latin. I'm going to use Latin. You can enjoy it or not. Right. Totem, totem. Right. Totally center. Top to bottom. In and out. Heart, soul, strength. The whole deal. Right. But totally forgiven and thereby saint, made saints through the blood of Jesus. You're right. At the same time. Well, how can that be? We still have our bodies. We still have flesh and blood. As long as we have flesh and blood, we remain sinners in need of forgiveness. What about the day of resurrection? Then the essential confession of the Christian church. There's no need for forgiveness of sins in the resurrection because we'll have the fruit of that forgiveness, which is the new heavens, the new earth, the new, and our bodies restored and made whole without sin. So there it won't be part total, total. It'll be just saint. Now we're saints by God's declaration, right? By a word, forgiveness bestowed. Um, but we, this is what Paul calls seeing in a mirror dimly. It's like, I don't know. Do you guys clean your mirrors? Yeah. You did. That was pretty good, Dorothy. You did. Oh yeah. Don't. Should be fine. If, if you don't tell her she's supposed to be upset, then she doesn't get upset. It's like, oh, I fell. The chair fell on me. Oh, well. That's how you're supposed to react to things. All right. <laughs> Uh, so what are we talking about? Oh, being un made, un made clean again. Sprinkling. There we go. So I gave you some scriptures. And rather than jump around and quote, I just quoted them straight up on, the, on your handout. So you look at the bottom of page one. This is 1 Peter. This is, the, this is the introduction of his book. By the way, 1 Peter is a book on baptism. It's a baptism homily. I would say it's, I say it's preaching for baptism. It'd be a good sermon to read out of baptism. It's not that long. To the pilgrims of the dispersion, then he lists a bunch of places, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So you get it all right there, right? You've been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive you. That has made you new creation, sanctified you by the Spirit, who alone gives you the works to do. And all this is by God's eternal and elect, you know, foreknowledge, that he's known this from before the foundation of the world, that he chose you. Packs it all right in there. And that's our theology of baptism right there too. Baptism washes us clean of our sins, announces what's always been true, that we've been God's child, that he chose us from the foundation of the world, and that now he makes us a new creation, right? To live in faith and love. Isn't that beautiful? 
I don't think we usually read the very beginning of the book because we get hung up on all the names. I can't remember all the names of the places. But if you just skip the names, then it's beautiful. Ezekiel here, as I like to do, mixes metaphors of blood sprinkling and other priestly cleansing ceremonies fe- featuring the sprinkling of water. So I mentioned this in, at the end of church, but here it is. Is that this is something that's bugged me for a long time. And I still, frankly, I haven't gotten over it. But I think the basis of the New Testament's um, mixture of blood and water as, and, and flipping the metaphor back and forth, they got from the prophet. Because Ezekiel does this. Right? Is that we're talking about being sprinkled, where was it? With clean water, but you'll be clean from all your uncleannesses and from the idols I will cleanse you. But that wasn't done by the ritual washings. That was done by the blood sacrifices. And so he puts the two together here. The New Testament runs with this. Revelation is the famous one. I think I quoted on here somewhere. Probably on the back side. Yes, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Of course, as, you know, I'm a rational person. I'm like, you don't make things white by washing them with blood. That makes them bloody, right? Yeah, I guess God can, right. But, but you see, that's the connection. They're made white. Do you mean literally white? Does he mean clean? Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? Um, and then you have the same thing. Let us draw near with a true heart and the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the writer of the Hebrews does the same thing. He connects being washed with water and having our hearts, that is blood, um, being atoned for as well. So he kind of, I think, is he, I mean, he's just packing it all. In that one verse, he's putting both the ritual washings, all the ablutions that the high priest does. He's got to wash his hands. They've got to wash their hands and feet. We read about that in daily prayer, right? In the laver, the basin, right? At the entrance to the holy place. And then, uh, but he's also connecting it to all the blood that gets sprinkled on the altar and on the priest and on the people, which I was, you know, you give them these beautiful vestments, and then you got to pour blood, sprinkle blood all over them. Which tells you, don't put your trust in the vestments. The vestments are a sign of a future holiness that comes in the forgiveness of sins, not in the, not in the vestments themselves. So as beautiful as they are, they're, defi- in a sense, defiled, but actually made clean through blood. You got all the mixed metaphors in your head now? Makes complete sense, right? Yeah. Um, Eze- Ezekiel uses the phrase... I will sprinkle clean water on you. So I suppose you could take that literally and say, what is he talking, what kind of water is he talking about? No, he's talking about the water you get out of your reverse osmosis filter. Or from a spring and not, by the way, not the Jordan River. The ice mountain, right. Not the Jordan River because, I mean, even Naaman, the, uh, the Syrian, he's like, I'm not going to go wash in the Jordan. Like, Abana and the Parfar, those are, in Damascus, those are clean. The, Jordan is filthy, and it's true, it is. <laughs> and it was, right? It was a filthy river. That's not what he means. He doesn't mean literally clean. He means water that brings clen- cleansiness, cleansiness, right? Um, other so- uh, sci- uses of washing is to take away people's sins. You can read that in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, Right? Uh, but also Isaiah 4. Washing is a sign of repentance. Isaiah 1, Jeremiah 4. But that's a little different than here. But the, the, the one truth that's consistent through both Old Testament and New Testament is people don't wash themselves. Now that's usually how we think of it. Like you go wash your hands. But from God's perspective, it's the, the cleansing that comes from the wash, from the action, comes through the word that's attached to the action. Okay, do you, does this make sense? This is what we believe about baptism, Lord's Supper, right? It's not our action that makes it what it is. It's not our eating and drinking, not alone, right? But it's faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. That's what makes it a sacrament. Same thing with baptism. It's not the washing, it's not the water that does these things, but it is the word of God in and with the water that does them. Right? Same thing here. And it's always been true. All those sacrifices, all the ritual washings, all the blood sprinkled, that they're efficacious not by the doing of them. We have an actual, another Latin phrase. Esther, leave him alone, please. Esther, leave him alone. 
I'm not dealing with that. You need to leave him alone, please. Yeah. I mean, in a way, could when the blood and the water pour from Jesus' side, mm -hmm. be symbolic of of course not eating that blood yeah. sacrifice anymore, and you know that it kind of all took on a meaning. Yeah, exactly. I think John's very. I mean, that's alone in John's gospel, but it's clear when the spear pierces him, blood and water, because then in First John he actually interprets the event. So the key to interpreting scripture often is just to find the other scripture that. And so there he says, but these three testify, the blood, the water, and the spirit. And these three agree. And he's referring to baptism, Lord's Supper, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah. Um, so he had, his sacrifice takes the place of all the previous sacrifices. But it's not by the doing of it, although the doing of it is necessary, right? It is necessary that he die for sins. But it would have no benefit to us unless there was a word of promise attached to, to it. Right? So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. That's the apostle's word, directed by the Holy Spirit. So without the promise attached to it, it's just another guy dying at the hands of the Romans as they killed, you know, they killed three at least on that day, right? <laughs> and thousands, you know. And what, yeah, thousands, thousands. What's the point of another man dying by crucifixion unless there's a word of promise attached to his death, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. So we're, we're cautious about people putting trust in the thing itself without the word. So, you know, like holy water. Uh, I was at a Roman parish, the Roman parish in Sheboygan. What is that, holy name, I think, the cathedral? Right, and they have all these little bottles of holy water you can buy. And like, well, what, what's the, pro you know, you just, you want to be a jerk and just ask them, so what's the promise attached to this little bottle of water? <laughs> Where, uh, right, because, well, the promise is that the priest has blessed it. And you're like, okay. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing with the sacrament of the altar. I think the best practice, um, I don't, we don't have God's command on this, so this is personal there, there's historic precedent for what I'm about to say, but that, that's still just tradition, okay? But that the best practice um, amongst, uh, the opinion amongst Lutherans is that whatever is not eaten and drunk at the Lord's Supper is, cons is consumed or disposed of reverently. It's not to be saved and preserved for other use. So the bread and wine is to be eaten and drunk. That's what it's for, because that's the word that's attached to it. If it's not eaten and drunk, then you consume it or you dispose of it. With the blood we, we poured out on the ground in the same way that his blood was poured out at the cross. That's, at least that's the kind of piety that we've got on that. We don't pour it down the drain, we don't treat it as refuse, right? That's the point. It doesn't go into the sewer, or into the septic or whatever. Yeah, and that's just, an, uh, it's just to confess, that's what, that was, that's what that's for. That's for eating and drinking for the forgiveness of sins, right? And so we limit it to that. Same thing with holy water. Like, we baptize, and then do, do you, like, send home the water with the, to be used for other things afterwards? Even kind of holy water? No. Um, we don't. And actually, we're, we're even less concerned about the water being, like, special water or something, or, I don't know. You just find a bowl at the hospital and put some water in it and just go if you have to baptize, yeah. I usually consume them, which sometimes gets a little awkward if I don't count it out quite right. Because you've had like one at a time. <laughs> Plus, I don't, I don't, I don't usually eat that much bread. Anyway, um, so it goes. Yeah. So I try to be careful about that. And it's it, again, it's just it's tradition, but also kind of a reverence to say, but the th the thing isn't the point, right? Because this is what happened. The Roman Church abused that, and whatever was left over, they would put in a box called a tabernacle at the altar, and then they had times where you come to church and pray to the body and blood of Jesus on the altar. They still do. Uh, they call these uh, times of adoration or something like that. Depends on the church. Right? And now they would use that sacrament then, the priests or the deacons especially would take, take the sacrament then to homebound and shut in through, throughout the week. So they would, they would borrow from that throughout the week. But whatever was left, then that was in a box. That's why the candle is lit called the eternal flame to let you know that there's body and blood on the altar. Which is kind of weird that we had a can't is it lit yet? No, it isn't, I don't think. No. We still haven't dealt with that. But there's no, the, that candle, the tradition of that is attached to the reserving of the body and blood. So um, that doesn't mean the Protestants can't attach their own meaning to another candle, whatever. Right. But that's where it came from. All right. So anyway. Yeah. So uh, 
I mean, I suppose you could save the water if you wanted. I'm not, not, I don't want to give you any ideas. You could save the water and then like sprinkle it on yourself every year and to remember your baptism or something. We give you a candle and you relight the candle every year. That's the idea with that, right? So I suppose you could. I, um, the, the, the point is that our faith or our trust needs to be in the word that was given to us there, namely God's name and his promise that we are his child. Follow? All right, that's a good, good conversation. Where were we? Uh, oh, yeah. Other thing to note here, he's talking about sprinkling with water. He's going to talk about creating, giving you a new heart. He's going to talk. He talks about all these things that God are going to, is going to do to make them clean, but he doesn't tell them how. So we just talked about, we have rites and rituals for this. We have baptism makes us clean. We have the, you can come confess your sins and be absolved, right? You can confess your sins to one another and be absolved. We have actual, like, here's ceremonies, right? Or rituals to do this that have God's word attached to them as well, right? God has promised that whoever sins you remit, they are remitted them. Or that's the old translation. See, I defaulted back again. What was it? Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained, right? But there's a promise, right? Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. So we we can have a whole ritual. We actually, this morning, used one of the other confessions in our hymnal, the one from Compline, where we confess to each other, right? Which is different way to do it. I thought it would be helpful um, for any number of reasons. But um, is it ritual? Yeah, it's ritual, but it's also true because it has God's promise attached to it. That if you forgive me, I'm forgiven. If I forgive you, you're forgiven. Just as brothers and sisters, not even as like in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, which we also hear. All right. So the office of keys is given to the church, normally exercised by the pastor. We can do it to each other. Where were we? Ah, Yes. Ezekiel mentions no ceremonies, but only divine monergism. There's another big word for you today. Mono, meaning single. Uh, Urgism. (laughs) You hear the word energy in there? Yeah, by God's doing. By God's doing. Divinely, God alone. God alone accomplishes his people's full redemption. Same thing in Deuteronomy 30. So the context is eschatological, or of the last day. God will finally cleanse his people by the removal of their sinful nature so that they never shall again sin or be unclean. And go see some scripture on that. Yet God acts now to cleanse his people, even though in this present life, we, sinners and saints at the same time, thank you, Alice, continue to sin, repent, and be forgiven. So the daily life of the Christian is confession and absolution, which is our baptism. Historically, Christians have understood he will sprinkle many nations, Isaiah 52, as a prediction of the suffering servant's atoning work by shedding his blood and applying it to all believers in Christ. And I would say that's how you want to understand it here as well. Right? The sprinkling clean water on you, this is, as Vicki, I think, pointed out, right? The blood and water from his side. Right? There's a, that's a good connection. Through faith in Christ and God's word and sacraments, we are now cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus and rendered or declared saints according to his great gospel promise. Yet, as long as we live in this fallen world, our sinful nature wars against our regenerated nature as new creations in Christ. So both are true at the same time, and they're at war with each other. You're saints of God by his declaration, and you're sinners according to the flesh, and these two things are opposed to each other. So if you ever wonder why you feel conflicted (laughs) about what you should do and what you shouldn't do, that's the reason, because there's two words at war. There's the word of your flesh, and there's the word of God. All right. Yet, uh, we remain vulnerable to and often succumb to sin and uncleanness. For that, you can just read Romans 7 about that. That double life, the double life of the Christian. Sinners and saints. A note on the connection of this text to the sacrament of baptism. All right, so I just wanted to add this. Because, I mean, obviously, we hear us, we hear being made cleansed, and we hear, and we hear water sprinkling, Right? So we can't help but think of baptism. But this is not one of the texts that we use to teach baptism, chiefly, anyway. All right, and we'll talk about why. It's not exclusively a prophecy or a type of baptism, nor a prophecy of a general cleansing from sin that takes place through faith in Christ, which is also true, faith that is created by the Holy Spirit, working through the Word apart from the sacrament. All right, so there are times where people come to faith and then are baptized. There's other times where people are baptized and then come to faith. All right, it works both directions. God... Works when and where he wills. His spirit does, right? That's what Jesus says. So we have the Ethiopian eunuch coming to faith, hearing, reading the gospel scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> uh, and then he says to Philip, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Right? He already believes. He just wants baptism, um, which I cited there. 
Yeah. Did I? No, I didn't cite it. Did I? Hmm, I didn't. I should have. Ethiopian eunuch. Other times it works the other way, right? They're baptized and then they're brought to faith. That's what we do with children generally, infants. Uh, and then during the intertestamental period, which we don't know very much about, we know a lot more than we used to know because we discovered the scrolls at Qumran, that's at the Dead Sea in the caves. Then we find out all sorts of things that we didn't know about a whole community that was living there and they wrote everything down and miraculously gets preserved for 2,000 years for us to find and read. All right, so at Qumran we know, these are the Essenes, Maybe John the Baptist has interacted with them. I think he probably did. It seems like he picked up things from them. Um, the Essenes have a, a baptism that they would give to people who wanted to join their community. Called the proselytes. Those are called proselytes. So they would be baptized and that would bring them into the community. John comes baptizing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, it's a baptism of preparation for Christ who is to come. All right. So it does seem that those two things um, are there, except I, I'd suggest Don, John has a divine mandate because that's what he says. He said, the Lord sent me to do this. All right, that's John 1. We don't have actually the word where God said, do this. Best we have is, is the prophecy from Isaiah that he will go before me to prepare my way. And then that's quoted by uh, Zechariah in the Benedictus, right? You, my son, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. Yeah. So, here's the point. Yes, we can hear baptism in here. No problem. Cleansing with water. Children are about done. I got one more sentence. You can make it. You're about out of steam. All right. But for Christian baptism, if you want to teach baptism, you go to the Lord's mandate where he actually commands and gives baptism, which is in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Right? And also Mark 16, 16. John, John 3, Nicodemus, and Acts chapter 1. Um... We quote at least two of those. We also quote Romans 6 and Titus chapter what for baptism? Titus chapter 3. All right. So in bap with our baptism in the catechism, we have four texts. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Mark 16, 16, uh, Romans 6 and Titus chapter 3, verse something. Can't remember. That's where you go if you want to teach about baptism. That isn't to say you can't hear baptism here too. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we, we rely upon the instituting text as the foundation for our teaching. This is really important when it comes not to baptism, but to the sacrament of the altar. Because a, um, a lot of Christians like to go to John chapter 6 to teach about the Lord's Supper. And it certainly refers to the Lord's Supper, but it doesn't give the Lord's Supper. It doesn't institute it. The instituting is actually on the night he was betrayed. So you can go to John 6 to learn something more about the supper, but if you want the foundational text that says, here's what it is, you have to go to Jesus' words instituting it. Does that follow? Yeah. So this happens a lot with our friends in the Roman church. They'll find some text that could refer to something if you wanted to stretch it a little bit or twist, but isn't the instituting text, and then it brings in distortions. Right? Because here it's like... Um, yeah, anyway. Follow so far? That's probably a good place. This one is done, clearly. I don't know if the sugar's wearing off. You have big hair. That's as far as I thought we could go, and I was right. All right, good. Um, so we'll talk about the new heart and the new spirit next week, which is another big topic, I think. All right. Depart in peace.